You know, when it comes to cinema, it's hard to find a movie sequel that is actually better than the original film. But every once in a while, we get a movie that is not a simple cash grab by a studio trying to squeeze out every dollar from a once popular movie series, or a story following the exact same plot as the original with none of the same charm or magic. No, sometimes we get sequels that justify their existence and even add to the original film. Movies like Empire Strikes Back, Top Gun Maverick, The Dark Knight, and after watching Denis Villeneuve's second instalment in his latest film franchise outing, adapting Frank Herbert's epic sci-fi book series, I can confidently say that Dune Part 2 is not a simple sequel, an unjustified cash grab. But rather, it is, simply put, excellent. It justifies its existence and all in all is a brilliant movie experience, not just for its flashy visuals or captivating music, but also for its story, its emotionally resonant characters and also the setup for future films. Because despite the fact that it does miss quite a few things from the novel, it still undoubtedly does justice to its source material. In other words, Dune Part 2 is a masterpiece in filmmaking. Definitely not perfect, but one of the best movies of the last few years, and unarguably a movie that will go down as a sci-fi great. And it has not been the best couple of years recently in blockbuster entertainment. With huge franchises like Star Wars and Marvel constantly releasing shows and movies ranging from mid to laughably bad, and studios like Disney enduring absolutely torrid end times at the box office, things haven't been great. Even so far in 2024, there hasn't been a single big release film that has sparked anything really positive. But one thing that has stood out from the rest this year, and so in my opinion, June Part 2 is the return, finally, of true cinema. So let's get started into the review and talk about the movie, but remember there will be high box spoilers for June part 2 in this video, so make sure to tread carefully. And also go watch the first movie if you haven't, if, because trust me, it will be worth your time. But without any further ado, let's get into it. Okay, so June top part 2 picks up pretty much right where the first movie left off, which is something I really liked. You know, a question going on to the movie was where would it start, where would we start, and I like that it's just straight from June 1 onto June 2 with Paul. Also, it's pretty good in the sense that we see Paul arriving to the Fremen base, or home if you will, for the first time, and we see how they treat him and what they thought of him for the first time when they saw him, and this is huge going forward, as surely, and then completely, the Fremen accept Paul as Muad'Dib or the Mahdi. But this isn't the actual start of the movie, because we start a bit before that with Princess Irulan, the daughter of the Emperor. And her whole role in this opening scene is pretty much just exposition, but it's good exposition, done in a natural way. Also something that we couldn't go this far into the review without talking about immediately is of course the visuals. Because my word, this movie looks unbelievable in every single shot, view and scene. It is so, so good. You know, one common issue that movies face nowadays is the oversaturation and overdose of CGI to an extent that the movie or series doesn't even feel real anymore and it just starts to fall apart at the seams. With June 2, while any scene may be CGI, it doesn't feel like it at all. It feels 100% natural and real, the exact thing the CGI is meant to be. In this film, we've got so many different places that we go to and see. We see Gady Prime, the homeworld of the Harkonnens in black and white, Arrakis under the setting sun in orange, and the normal hue during the day. And then even Irulan and the Emperor's home that we see regularly throughout the films. These different places all have different aesthetics which make them that much more memorable and give them each their own outstanding features. And staying on a similar topic, the cinematography of this movie is quite simply pure gold. Whether it's the sweeping shots of the sand dunes or of Arrakis or Paul standing still as an, as an explosion goes off behind him, every shot is pretty much perfect and accompanied with Hans Zimmer's unbelievable score, it creates for some excellent view. And yeah, the CGI is just brilliant, no two ways about it. And another thing that I have to say that I really like is the religious aspect of the story, which I think that they absolutely nailed. As you may know or not know that Fremen and a lot of the Dune world was based on Islam, with both terms Lisan al Gabe and Mahdi being actual Arabic, and I think that they did get that right, especially with Stilgar. And Stilgar for me is one of the smaller standout characters of this movie, because you wouldn't really expect him to be too important or to add too much to the story, but in the end he's actually hugely critical to the Fremen's acceptance of Paul as Lisan al Gabe. He's essentially Paul's biggest hype man on the side cheering Paul on. Even after Paul outrightly refuses that he is the design of Gabe, Stilgar still doesn't let it go, saying that Paul is too humble to admit it, just as the prophecy is foretold. And when he's with Stilgar, it's not a forced kind of humour that you see a lot nowadays, but it feels natural, organic. Another standout aspect of this film also has to be the sandworm sequence. So, Paul is going through the trials to become part of the desert, to become one of the Fremen, and his last task, but certainly not the least, is to successfully ride a sandworm. And just like this entire scene, the entire scene is so absolutely amazing. And the thing is, you know what is going to happen. 
It's literally shown to you in the trailer with Paul successfully riding the worm, yet still, when watching the movie, there's so much tension and suspense, which can again be attributed to the brilliant cinematography, screenplay and music, which are probably at their best in this scene. Also, something that shines all the way through is the acting, which is just perfect. And it is, of course, something that you would probably expect from a movie like June 2, with the casting of Timothy Chalamet, Franz Pugh, Josh Brolin, Zendaya, all brilliant actors, and they were great. Paul and Chani in particular were really good together in this movie, and another character that you might think go, may go a bit under the radar is Lady Jessica, because she actually ends up playing a huge role in this movie and is quite important to the storyline. Firstly, she is essentially forced into becoming the Fremen's reverend mother and takes the water of life. She also is hugely important in spreading the word about Paul and him being the prophet and all. Also, June who sets up an extremely interesting plotline for the third movie with Jessica being pregnant with Paul's sister Alia, who will no doubt be an important factor in the movies to come. And now we have to talk about, perhaps, or at least in my mind, definitely the standout character of this movie, and that is Austin Butler as Fade Rother Harkonnen. Because Fade Rother in this movie is pretty much just the perfect villain. His introduction in the arena is chilling in black and white, and his psychotic behaviour and sadistic nature is so well executed by Austin Butler, and he just ex elevates the character to one of the best. Also, his final fight with Paul at the end of the film was truly unbelievable to watch. Usually, with blockbuster films and franchises like Star Wars, DC, Marvel especially, and even The Lord of the Rings, you get used to the final sequence being a huge action-packed bat battle sequence that ends up dragging on sometimes for a lot more than it needs to. And so it's definitely refreshing and a lot more exciting, in my opinion, to have the whole epic film to culminate in not a huge action set-piece, but rather one fight to the death between two brilliant warriors, with everyone else, friends, family and soldiers watching on. And the way that the fight ended, with Paul wounded, managing to find an opening and finish off Fade Rother, was done amazingly. Because it's clear to Paul that he will not be able to defeat Fade in a straight battle one on one. And so what happens, or at least in my opinion, is that Paul allows himself to be hurt in a place that won't be lethal. What this does is open up Fade, who thinks that he's won and decides to gloat over the win and enjoy himself and enjoy seeing Paul suffer as he dies. And this is an Achilles heel that is eventually fatal to Fade's character and is actually pretty representative of Rafa's personality, since we know him to be completely sadistic and cruel. So he gloats over the win but opens himself up in the process, allowing Paul to drive the blade into him, finishing the battle. It was honestly pretty confusing what happened in that scene on the first thing, but after rewatching it, how Paul managed to end that fight makes a lot more sense. So yeah, in summary, Fade Rotha is a standout character in this movie. One character that is not, however, who takes an absolute, just like, complete backseat is Dave Bautista's Raban. And I have to say, I feel sorry for this guy because he has an absolutely horrid time in this movie. Firstly, after being given absolutely complete control of Arrakis from his uncle Lennon, after defeating the Atreides himself, he struggles to get any grip on the planet whatsoever or to keep the Fremen in control. He's then replaced with Fade, who makes Raban kiss his feet, which would have been gut-punching, and then to top it all off, he's killed by Gurney Halleck. In keeping with the Harkonnens, towards the end of the movie, Paul gets the most perfect revenge that you could ask for, as he enters the Emperor's throne room and killing the Baron was so satisfying to hear after everything that the Harkonnens have done to the Atreides, and seeing it happen was so satisfying, like I said, because of how much that the Baron has hurt Paul. But overall, it's actually hard to think of one particular favourite scene in this movie for me, just because of how good pretty much everything is. Well, one of my favourite scenes has to be the Fremen are do ready to do battle and Paul yells, long live the fighters. And like, that scene right there still gives me goosebumps even now. It's so good, even though I'm pretty sure that they changed the phrase from the book. Speaking of, let's now talk about book versus movie, because there's quite a lot to talk about here. Okay, so overall the movie is quite loyal to the book in the bigger themes, messages and plot lines. But where the real issues arise are in the smaller details that you probably have to have read the book to pick up on. Firstly, for me, one of the most noticeable changes was Chani, because for the majority of the book, or even all of it, Chani is with Paul in every decision that he makes, and supports him fully. But in the movie, she clearly feels like Paul being the Lisan of Gabe, and his decisions, especially towards the end of the movies, were quite bad, and she didn't really support Paul a lot of the way, and she didn't really support his decisions. That being said, Zendai still does a brilliant job of portraying Chani. Also something that I've already mentioned is Alia, Jessica's daughter and Paul's sister, and how she doesn't actually end up being born in this movie. And the way that the timeline of the movie works, if you need a refresher, is that the movies June 1 and June Part 2 together make up the first June book, with each movie telling one half of the original story. And in the original June book, Alia was born in that novel, whilst Jessica and Paul are living with the Fremen in the desert. Whilst it is somewhat disappointing that she hasn't turned up yet, I can't wait personally to see her hopefully in the next movie in the series. 
However, her not being in the movie actually changes one big thing, and that is po- that Paul is the one to kill the Baron Harkonnen, not Alia. But honestly, I quite like the change, so I won't dive too deep into that one. And honestly, even though there are a few other differences, I don't really have any other issues with any of them. Now, to finish off, let's talk about probably my favourite aspect of this movie that not only was amazing in this film, but sets up so much in the future for where Denis Villeneuve will take the story and how he will portray Paul's character going forward. And that is, of course, Paul's lust for power and his slow descent over the course of his story. And before we carry on with this segment, just a fair warning that there will be huge spoilers for future Dune movies and books right now. So if you haven't read the books already or don't care about spoilers at all, you should probably, you can watch it if you want, or you should just skip ahead to avoid the huge spoiling. Because it is no secret to fans of the book that Paul is not necessarily a good guy. He's not your traditional protagonist who fights evil and is on the side of good. In fact, Paul can probably best be described as an anti-hero. He doesn't make the best decisions by any stretch of the imagination and does what he does to help himself. But this doesn't mean that he's the villain though, and he's not an absolute villain like the Baron Harkonnen, because even though he does kill billions and billions of people by the end of the story, he does this because he foresees it as one of the best outcomes for humankind. So, in June 2, Paul's descent is really well portrayed and started off, as towards the end of the movie he definitely changes and you can really see that, as he loses all sense of diplomacy, instead resorting to trying to force the different houses to accept his ascension to the throne. In fact, it even comes across that Paul at the end was slightly delusional, or gone crazy with the want for revenge for his father and his house. All in all though, I absolutely loved Paul in June 2, and in my mind, Timothy Chalamet's portrayal of Paul is the best one to date out of every Dune adaptation that we have received. However, before we finish off, there is maybe one or two gripes and issues that I picked out that I definitely think could be better. And that's why unfortunately this movie just doesn't reach the 10 out of 10 level in my opinion. Firstly, and I can't believe that I'm about to say this, but this movie needs to be longer. Which is, I know, a crazy thing to say for a 2 hour and 45 minute long movie. But I feel like that final fight at the end and Paul taking the water of life was not really that fleshed out. And I feel like the build up to it may not have been enough since it's a pretty significant scene. Both the final fight at the end with Fay Rotha and Paul and Paul taking the water of life before that. Then of course the other issue that I have are the changes from book to movie. But only a couple of the tweaks are really are an issue anyways for me. So we, there's not really too much to talk about there. Okay then, that is the end of our review for June 2. In summary, this movie is nothing short of a masterpiece in its story, its visuals, its music and pretty much everything else you can just think of. It is by far the best adaptation of Frank Herbert's novel and despite having a couple of differences, fully does justice to the source material. The acting is phenomenal and also we have some really good uh, setup for future movies with Paul going to fight the other houses and his marriage to Princess Ruin for political benefits yet to be explored. And so, Dune 2, whilst being the perfect continuation of the Dune 1 movie, even being better than its predecessor in fact, is also remarkably the ideal start of so much more to be explored in the Dune universe. Anyways, that is the end for today's video. Make sure to comment down below what you thought of Dune Part 2, whether it did justice to the books, and what you hope to see in the future from Denis Villeneuve's in this universe. Thanks so much for sticking around till the end. If you did enjoy, make sure to like the video, subscribe, and turn on notifications for more Dune content and more. Because I talk about all loads of other franchises and fandoms, including Star Wars, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, Hunger Games, Marvel, Avatar, and more. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.